The narrative from Matthew 27, we'll start at verse 62, and we'll read through all the way through the, the end of chapter 28. Jesus had been put on the cross, he had been put to death, a Roman soldier to make sure that Jesus was dead, pierced through his chest with a spear, and the Bible says blood and water came out, showing that he had died of a ruptured heart. Jesus was then wrapped in the traditional manner and put in a tomb. And we find here in verse 62, it says, Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that deceiver said while he was yet alive, After three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Now what they were wanting to avoid was Jesus being turned into a martyr and them trying to claim that he was raised from the dead. They wanted Jesus to stay dead. They wanted him to stay in the tomb. And so they took these steps. And so Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch. That means you have a some Roman soldiers that will uh, stand guard. Go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. In the end of the Sabbath day, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven And came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, and there shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations." baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Dear Father, may the power of the resurrected Christ be ours today, Lord, in our minds and our hearts. And Lord, may it rejuvenate our Christian lives so that we live more vibrantly for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is interesting that the steps that the enemies of Christ took to keep Jesus in the tomb were the very evidences that only a miracle would take him out. The things that they did to keep him in there demonstrate that only God could get him out. It was as if they were trying to keep him in there in defiance of his prophecy and it backfired on them. So I want us to look today about the steps they took, the things that they did. Now, we know that uh, whatever they did, they did with the wrong motives. They did it with evil motives. Uh, They didn't want Jesus to be uh, revered by the people. They called him a deceiver. Uh, They thought he was a charlatan. And so they had him crucified. 
and put away. He was trouble. Uh, they didn't want him anymore. They wanted his disciples to just fall by the wayside and this not be a movement at all. And so they did what they could to squelch uh, Christ and his legacy. And so uh, they put him to death. They also put him in the tomb. They rolled a stone, a big heavy stone that took several strong men to move onto the mouth of the stone. They put a seal on it. And that means where the stone met the, the wall of the sepulcher, they put a Roman seal uh, so that uh, by law, it was forbidden by law to, to move that stone. All the weight of Rome was behind that seal. Uh, and they also put guards there. And we know there was a good number of guards because the Bible says that some of the guards came to talk and, and the rest weren't even there, just some of them. So there was a, a plural number of them talking with the elders, which means they were perhaps a minority group of the greater number that were there. Uh, and so we have here a, a situation where there were barriers placed against the resurrection of Christ. So I want to talk this morning about breaking the barriers of the resurrection. Jesus, by the power of, of, of God himself, who he was God in the flesh, he predicted and he foretold that he would die. And so we're going to look at these barriers, and I think we can draw some applications to barriers that keep people away from salvation today that keep people away from new life. So let's first of all, let's look at the, the barrier that is most obvious. There was a physical barrier uh, in the way of Jesus coming out of that, of that tomb. And that is that he was dead. Now make no mistake, mistake about it. Jesus said that he would die. And he did die. He said, no man takes my life from me. I give it up. And on the cross, the Bible says that he gave up his spirit. He said, it is finished. And his head fell on his chest and he had a lifeless body. And when the guards saw him, they remarked that he was dead. And just to make sure, they took a spear and went up into his chest. And as we said, the blood and water came out, which showed that his heart had burst. And so he was gone. And so Jesus was unable, physically, his body was unable to come out of that tomb. Until and unless his spirit returned into that body, he had a physical barrier. Now, there's one thing uh, that a dead body can't do, despite all the movies, is walk. Now, they have all these zombie movies where they have the undead walking around. Not going to happen. If someone is dead, they're not going to walk. Uh, you know, I worked in a hospital four years, and some of you have medical backgrounds, and some of you have been around death. And you understand that there's one thing about a dead body is, is they're, they're unable to do anything to help themselves. They're going to be there, uh, and there's nothing they can do. Now, Jesus' body was just as dead as any body had ever been. Jesus died on purpose for you and for me, and so his death was real. Uh, there are those who try to put forth the idea they call the swoon theory. And they try to say that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He, he just looked like he died. And they put him in the, the grave and he was actually still alive. And of course, this is ridiculous. For him to have been able to get out of there, he would have had to roll that heavy stone away himself. And even after being closed in there three days and three nights without food and water and medical care, after all the torturous treatment that he had, for him to survive that is beyond belief. And so there was a physical barrier for him walking out and, and that he was dead. Now, I want to just make an application about this and, and spiritualize it a little bit. Why is it that more people don't come to Jesus Christ? What is the hindrance? What is the barrier for people coming to Christ? Well, here it is. The Bible says that, that before salvation, that people are dead in trespasses and sins. They're dead. Now, just as Jesus' body, unless life was given to it, was not going to come out of that tomb, a lost person, until and unless the Holy Spirit of God enlightens them and draws them to himself and empowers them, is unable to help himself, is unable to be saved on his or her own. We are unable to come to God unless and until God calls us unto himself. A divine work must take place to quicken our spirits to receive eternal life. So you see that just as there was a physical barrier that kept Jesus in the tomb because his body was dead and could not help itself until life came again, that there was this physical barrier. He was just unable. His body was unable to move. But there was another barrier, and it's an interesting one. There was a, a legal barrier. 
In other words, it was against the law for that stone to be moved. Now, the way I understand the Roman seal, it's similar today as we would have, for instance, an officer, uh, if he wants to stop a car, uh, he has a badge. Now, this badge uh, is no match uh, for the car. Physically speaking, the badge does not have power over the car. It is a legal power, and it represents the government. It represents the law. And so under penalty of law, this badge represents the law. Now, that wax seal was not strong enough to keep that stone from moving, but what it did represent was that the Roman government, under harsh penalty of death, said, you cannot move this stone. This stone is sealed by the Roman government. So this was a legal barrier to this tomb being opened. And it was punishable upon death by crucifixion to break a Roman seal. It was a very important thing. Uh, The power of Rome uh, invested everything it had into this wax seal with the Roman insignia upon it. So this was a legal barrier. It was against the law. But now here's the wonderful thing. God does not recognize the law of Rome. God is not limited by human rulers. God is the king of kings and lord of lords. And to God, that Roman seal was just a gob of wax. And so when it came time for that stone to move, it moved. Listen, God doesn't ask permission from Caesar to do anything. Uh, Jesus Christ does not bow to any mortal ruler uh, in this world. Now, we are supposed to subject ourselves to the rulers and the powers that be, but when God decides to move upon something, Satan has to move away, his minions have to move away, all earthly rulers have to bow, Jesus was going to come out of that grave and there was no legal claim that could keep otherwise. Jesus Christ is bigger than Rome, and so he broke that barrier through. Well, let's bring the application to human beings. You know, the Bible says that, that Satan is the god of this world. He is the prince, that means ruler, of the power of the air. And he is the spirit that, listen, rules in the hearts of the children of disobedience. You know what that means? That Satan has a kingdom. He has a kingdom, and he rules in that kingdom. And people who are not yet saved, people who have not been born again, are part of his kingdom. He has a legal claim upon them because they are within his satanic kingdom. Uh, Jesus told one group of people that you are of your father, the devil, and the works of your father you will do. Uh, And so we see that uh, the devil has a rule upon people. In fact, that uh, word is used in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Uh, Turn with me, if you will. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. Now listen, what, what it's saying here is that Satan had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now what the Bible is saying here is that Satan has people trapped in the law of sin and death. He has a claim upon their souls. And listen, there is no way that a lost person can be saved unless and until God breaks that chain and God breaks that bondage. God is powerful that can do that. Now, what happened about this legal claim, this legal barrier? Uh, Listen, as I said, when Jesus decides to come up out of that grave, that stone's rolling away. Uh, Jesus overcame the legal barrier because he has a higher legal claim. He is the God of gods. He is the Lord of lords. He is the King of kings. And there was no ruler, no power, but what has to bow to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the power of Satan may have a claim on you, but Jesus has a higher claim. And that claim is based on what he did on the cross. If Satan were to say, no, he's mine, Jesus can say, no, he's mine. And Satan has to concede. Why? Because Jesus bought you. He paid the price. He met the the sin debt and paid it in full. 
So there is a higher power than Satan. Now, Jesus uh, contested Satan's power to this world. And he went head to head against Satan and beat him on the cross. As the old prophecy said that uh, Satan, the seed of the serpent, would bruise the seed of the woman's heel. But the seed of the woman would bruise the seed of the serpent's head. And so as we see this happen, Jesus was wounded indeed. But his wound was temporary. He came alive again. Satan was defeated forever. And so there is a higher claim uh, than that of Satan. Jesus bought us with his blood. We are set free from the prison of sin and death. We are given liberty through Jesus Christ. We're no longer subject to the old world. Listen, you know, you have the ability as a Christian to live different than Satan wants you to live. You have the ability in Jesus' name to live a better life, a cleaner life, a more righteous life, a life that is more wholesome, a life that is more healthy, a life that is more productive, a life that is more Christ-honoring through His power than you did when you were lost and bound by the laws of sin and death. We have been set free through Jesus Christ. So just as Jesus broke through that legal barrier, Jesus can help any person who comes to Him in faith break out of the kingdom of Satan. And listen, we're still living here. We still have the kingdom of of Satan ruling and running things. But listen, here's here's the wonderful thing. Our citizenship is up there. Yes, I'm an American. And and I'm I'm glad I'm an American. Uh, Sometimes I I really worry about our country and its direction. But listen, I'm glad to be an American. But before I'm an American, I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And I practice my faith, I practice my Christianity in this country that God has placed me in. And to be a good citizen of this country means sometimes I have to point at its sins and point at its mistakes and call this country to task about how it is going the wrong direction. Sometimes the best friend a country can have are those voices within it that call them to righteousness and call them to correct the evils that are upon it. Christians have done this since day one. And we've made a great influence in the things of the world. When we see something evil, we call it evil and we call for change. And so it is that the the, the legal barrier was overcome. But there was also another barrier, and that's this great big stone. This is a structural barrier. It was there as a physical, structural barrier to the resurrection of Christ. Let's just say, and of course it's impossible, but let's just say for the sake of argument... That after being scourged nearly to death, after agonizing in the garden and so that his sweat was as were great drops of blood, after being put on the cross and going through the agonies with all of his bones out of joint, and after having a spear run through his chest, let's see that somehow Jesus' heart was still beating and he was still alive. Uh, Could he possibly roll that stone away himself? Of course not. It took several strong men to move that stone. Uh, The women, when they came, they were wondering, who's going to move the stone? They knew that a a company of women couldn't move it. It it takes several strong men to do it. And so there was a physical barrier there against Jesus coming out of that tomb. And and so uh, we need to also look at this, that this, this stone is not just a stone, a physical structural barrier to the tomb. This stone is kind of a metaphor, something in the way. Something in the way, something that keeps you where you are, something that you have to overcome. And it, become a, it can become a metaphor for any kind of barrier that would keep a soul from salvation. Now, I just want to enlarge upon that. We who are on earth have a structural barrier against us being in heaven. Just as there is a great gulf fixed between heaven and hell, and people can't cross from one place to the other, there is a great gulf fixed between this physical reality and the spiritual heavenly reality that we will one day go to as Christians. There is no spaceship that can take you to heaven. There there is no physical means to get there. It takes a miracle to get there. So just being human beings means that we are barred from heaven unless a miracle takes place. So there is a structural barrier. But now let's understand also that there are spiritual barriers that exist that are just as real as that stone was upon that. And this could be the barrier of addictions. 
There are people who are caught up in addiction so much that they would avoid Christianity. They would avoid receiving Christ because they're afraid of having to give up their favorite vice or their favorite sin. And I've talked to some people that said, I just don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can give it up. Well, let me say, that's a barrier. But Jesus can overcome those barriers. I remember in the late 60s and early 70s, there was a a great problem with heroin addiction in our country, and it's still a problem today. Uh, uh, Physical addiction to, uh, to illegal drugs is a big problem today. But I remember that there was a group of Christians who were going into the community in the inner city and trying to lead addicts to Jesus Christ, and they had a hard time dealing with it because they knew they were going to have to give up their dope. And so what they would do with these is they would, uh, uh, they would talk to them and they would get them to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And they found that in many cases, the Lord Jesus Christ gave them power to overcome that addiction and they were able to give it up and be free from it. It was a miraculous work of God because they trusted him to break through that barrier and to not do that. And many a times a, a prostitute has been saved and become a, a, a godly woman and a, and a wife and a mother and changed her life entirely entirely many times a hopeless alcoholic that that might be unemployed and unable to help himself and slovenly and and just all but given up on by society would come to Jesus Christ and that barrier would be broken through and he would find himself to get strong and fit and a, a good contributing member of society how many times the Holy Spirit of God has set somebody free from those barriers that exist out there Uh, Listen, uh, these things that that can keep someone bound are are more physical than people realize. They they keep people in bondage. They keep people down. Sometimes there is this idea that people have that my job is in my way or my career is in my way or my hobbies are in my way. Listen, all of those things are just stones over the mouth of your tomb. God can roll those away. You can't do it, but God can God can. God can give you victory over those things. Well, then we have another barrier. And we'll just call this a martial barrier because it has to do with the military. Listen, these weren't carpenters guarding the tomb. These weren't bakers. These weren't farmers. Uh, These weren't tinkers or shoe repairmen. Uh, These were Roman soldiers. And those that were in Pilate's inner circle were often decorated war heroes. Uh, They were the the, the Praetorian guards, uh, the the best of the best. And they said, we want you to set a watch. Well, they wanted Pilate to set it. And we know that they were Pilate soldiers because uh, he was the one that they were accountable to when they had to tell their story. And so uh, there were a number of soldiers there. And listen, they, they weren't there unarmed. They were there armed. So this was uh, a martial barrier. There were armed men guarding the tomb. Now, how many armed men did they have? Well, they had enough armed men so that if Jesus' disciples tried to, dis- to steal the body away, they wouldn't be able to do it. So they had enough to repel any such force as that. And let's understand something. For a Roman soldier to go to sleep when he was on watch was death. That was the rule. You fall asleep when you're supposed to be on watch, you die. No Roman soldier would go to sleep on a watch unless he expected to just forfeit his life. And so these soldiers were there. They were wide awake. But I love what happened. God sent an angel to roll the stone back. Uh, If I were an angel, I'd have loved that job. There's the guards. You show up out of nowhere. These guards are looking at you, and they're beginning to shake. Their knees are shaking. And I tell you what, angels had a way of revealing themselves in a manner appropriate to the time. Sometimes they just looked like men, and they weren't all that frightening. I think this angel put on some glory for them. He looked like lightning. I think maybe he gave them the look. You know, the look like... Gave him that angel, I'm going to get you look. I don't know what it is, but I know one thing. Strong, seasoned Roman soldiers fainted dead away at the sight of this angel. And so the stone was rolled away. Listen, I want to tell you something. I don't care how mighty some army may be. When Jesus decides to get in battle with them, it's over with a word. We know that at Armageddon, the 
the armies of the nations will assemble against him, led by the Antichrist himself, and he has a sword that proceeds out of his mouth, and the Bible says they will all be destroyed with the word of God. They are no match for Jesus Christ. And so these soldiers were no match for the power of God. Uh, the, the very things the enemies of, of Jesus did to make sure his body stayed in the tomb gave testimony to the miraculous resurrection. Now I want to talk a little bit about this, this lie that they told. They came and they reported what happened. You know what that means? That means that the elders of Israel, the Sanhedrin, heard the truth. That means they heard the real story. What did the soldiers say? Well, they told what happened. They said, we were guarding the tomb like we're supposed to. We had our weapons. We were wide awake. And this being showed up. He looked like lightning. He was shining all over. And he he was rolling the stone away. And the next thing I knew, I was waking up and the stone was moved and the body was gone. They heard that. The soldiers reported what happened. In other words, they told the truth. And the elders said, well, that won't do. We can't have the truth. So no, don't say that. Say this. Say this. The disciples came and stole him away while we slept. Now, how do you convince a Roman soldier to say about himself that he slept on his watch? Well, you have to make the incentive worthy of such a request. So they gave them money. How much money? Large money. Which means they had the money to do that with. They could pay Judas 30 pieces of silver. They could pay these soldiers large enough money for them to risk their lives and claim that they were asleep. And I always wondered how they would claim that the disciples came and stole the body if they were asleep. How did they know what happened? If they were asleep, they couldn't have seen what happened. But that doesn't mean anything. A lie is going to work if you want the lie to work. And so they paid them large money because people would rather believe the lie than believe the truth. And they went out and told that. And you know what they said? If the governor, if it comes to his ears that, that you slept, we'll secure him. In other words, we'll bribe him. We'll take care of him too and secure your lives. Listen, the stone being moved would surely have awakened the guards if they were sleeping. It would have wakened them up. There's no way that the disciples could have come and stolen the body quietly enough to not awaken these guards. So that lie didn't even hold water. His, uh, the disciples would have had to dispose of his dead body. And all of them agree to tell a lie that he was risen from the dead. They would have all had to go to torture and death, still claiming and holding on to that lie uh, for, for their story to be true. Uh, Not one, not one person ever blew the whistle or none of them ever said, no, we made it up. Chuck Colson, the Watergate conspirator that went to prison for his role in that great scandal, made a statement that I believe is worth quoting now. This is from Chuck Colson talking about the resurrection. By the way, he became a Christian in prison and became an evangel for the Lord. He's a a, a Christian man. He He said this, I know the resurrection is a fact. And Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. I love that quote because it brings it into reality. People do not tell a lie and hold to the lie under pain of torture and death. They would say, no, I'm sorry, we made it up. Let me live. But it never happened. Not a single time. There was uh, only unanimous acclamation that Jesus was raised from the dead. So they gave them money, gave them large money. Now this is true then, it's true now. The people who control the narrative, the people who control what goes out there, are the very wealthy, powerful people. And the more money they have, that they usually rob from the people, 
The Sanhedrin, listen, the Sanhedrin weren't farmers. They, they weren't craftsmen. They, they took their money from the people through taxes and, 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 and stealing it from widows. The Bible says they, they, uh, they took widows' houses. These were criminals. These were government people who were also criminals. Kind of sounds familiar. And so here it is. It says, as has been the case, the rich and powerful stay rich and powerful, not because they tell the truth, but because they tell the lie. And the more powerful and the more wealthy they are, the bigger and more uh, wealthy, uh, the, uh, powerful the lie machine can become. They gave them large money. Do you realize that there's always some religion or ideology behind the powers that be? It's interesting to me that the Sanhedrin were the representatives of the people and claimed that they hated Rome, they hated the oppressors, uh, they hated the, the, the government that was ruling over them with tyranny, and yet they were all in bed together when it came to Jesus. They were pals now. They were all on the same page. Listen, all you've got to do to get the secular governments to agree together is get them together against Christ and his people, and they will join hands against that. They will lay aside their animosity against one another, and they'll come together to persecute Christians. And this is what happened here. Listen, they, they sold out Jesus to the Romans to keep their own religious power. Even Pilate knew that it was for envy that they had delivered him unto him. And listen, Pilate, I, I, you've got to feel sorry for Pilate, really, because he didn't want this problem. He wanted it to go away. His wife says, have nothing to do with this just man, for I've suffered many things in a dream. Pilate wanted it to go away. And he kept trying to work this angle or work that angle to set him free. And finally, only when it was politically dangerous for him to continue, he washed his hands of it and said, see to it. And so it is that they had their way. He finally succumbed to their wishes and gave them the request. Now I think about this martial barrier and the, the, the legal way, or rather the, uh, the structural barrier that had there, uh, that we understand that, do you realize that today, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you can expect to experience the disfavor of many of your fellow citizens? If you accept the words of Scripture and try to live according to the principles of Jesus Christ, there will be people who will say, you're not a good person. If you believe what this book says over what they say, you're not a good American. If you believe what Christ taught instead of what the government teaches today and the government schools teach today, you're not a good citizen. There are human beings who are in place to keep the lost lost. Now let me, let me just put some stuff on this. These guards may or may not have even had an opinion about Jesus. These guards may not have disliked him. They may not have thought anything about him bad. All they know is they were placed to guard the tomb. They were doing what they were told. They were doing what they were assigned to do. And let me tell you something. There are people in this world who stand guard over other people, keeping them from Christ. What do you mean? Well, if someone says, I don't want you to go to church, or I don't want you going into that faith, I don't want you accepting Jesus and getting all religious, they're, they're like one of these guards. They are placed there by the ruler of this world to keep you where you are. And I've seen it happen so many times. I was talking to a man one time. He had a 10-year-old son. His 10-year-old son was under conviction about his soul. He was asking his Sunday school teacher about heaven, and he wanted to go to heaven, and he wanted to be saved. He wanted to accept Christ. He was under conviction about his need for Jesus and his need to be born again. And, and, and I talked to his father about it, and he said, no, I don't want to encourage that. I don't want to encourage that at all. I, I, want, to, I want to let him wait. I want to wait till he's older and at least past 12 or 13 where, where he wait. And I, and I thought, well, you know, it seems like the Lord's dealing with him now. And I understand that parents need to be sensitive about this thing. But I wonder, was that someone guarding someone else's soul? Jesus said, let the children come unto me for such is the kingdom of God. Don't ever put a barrier to someone who's trying to come to Jesus. Make the pathway clear. I've known of husbands that have kept their wives lost. I've known of wives that have tried to keep their husbands lost. I've known of parents to try to keep their children lost. 
Uh, And so I've seen that there are guards sometimes placed there. Listen, anyone that forbids you, intimidates you, or otherwise discourages you from repenting of sin and accepting Christ is like one of those guards in your life. And they need to be blown away by the power of God. Listen, you're better off without them. If your boyfriend discourages you from being a Christian young lady, you lose the boyfriend. He's not worth it. And listen, fella, if you have a girlfriend and she's not comfortable with you being a Christian, uh, you, you send her packing, get her away, and you find someone that loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, we have the right to tell those who are guarding the tomb, get away from me. Go. You are not able to keep me away from Jesus Christ. Satan wants to keep people away from Jesus, and he'll use whatever he can to do it. But listen, no human being on earth is more powerful than the voice of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit calls someone, and that is real, and you respond to that, all of those others fade away. I've told my testimony many times. You've heard it and heard it till you could repeat it yourself. But there was one barrier that I had. There was one thing that was pulling on me. There was one thing that was in the way of me walking down that aisle and accepting Jesus Christ as I was being asked to do. And that was my friends that were sitting to the right of me, my buddies. And as a teenage boy, I thought they'd make fun of me. I thought they'd uh, ridicule me and and all of that. And so for a while, I hesitated. I I, I thought, well, I don't know. It's embarrassing uh, to, to do this. They'll make fun of me. But then the power of God's conviction was greater than my fear of, of my friends. And I went forward. And it wasn't but a few seconds that they came forward and got saved too. And one of them, my friend Gerald, one of the best friends I ever had is in heaven today. He had cancer and he died. And he's in heaven and I'll see him one day. He was one of those that was, I was worried about. But now he's in heaven rejoicing in Jesus Christ. And one day I'll get to see my old buddy. And I don't know if he'll have red hair up in heaven. Probably not. But he was, he was my friend. Listen. Whoever you give up to come to Jesus, God's going to give you better. God's going to give you eternity. Uh, Every friend that you had to say goodbye to, to follow Jesus Christ, you're going to say goodbye to a hundred more that you'll live forever in eternity with. What a deal that is. Don't ever let the guards (laughs) uh, that Satan puts over you keep you away from Jesus Christ. His holy angels are more mighty and more powerful than all the human forces of the world. And uh, God can say a word and they have to bow to Him. You go to Jesus. You go to Jesus. You go to Jesus. He'll wrap you in His arms. He'll embrace you. He'll strengthen you. And all the powers uh, that are in the world, whether it be physical or legal or structural or military or whatever, have to bow to King Jesus. There's nothing that can keep someone from salvation when Jesus Christ uh, gives you new life. Jesus broke through all these barriers to rise from the dead. And you know what I believe? I don't believe Jesus came limping out of that tomb. And I don't believe his body was all ravaged with, with uh, complete destruction. He kept certain scars. Listen, he, his face was his face. His body was his body, but he kept some scars. He kept the ones in his hands. He kept the one in his side. Why? So they'd know it was him. He said, come, put your finger here. Put your hand here. It's me. It's me. But otherwise, he was strong and healthy and vibrant. His body was better than it ever was. He could appear or disappear. He could do anything. And he was real. Listen, Jesus broke through all those barriers to rise from the dead. His angels rolled away the stone. The Roman seal was broken like the worthless gob of wax that it was. The soldiers with all their arms (laughs) laying on the ground asleep unconscious for fear of the holy angel that God sent and all the power of Rome had to bow before Jesus who was now alive alive forevermore one day we will also be alive forevermore though we may die and our body may uh, see uh, uh, corruption the Bible says that one day our soul will be reunited with our body and we will be raised together uh, in new life with Jesus Christ in salvation we have these things these wonderful words. We have joy. We have hope. We have peace. We have grace. We have mercy. We have meaning. We have healing. We have heaven. We have power. We have purpose. We have blessing. We have honor. We have victory, forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life. And now, if we could have the lights, I'd like to show that wonderful video that I talked about earlier. I believe it would be a blessing to you. Brother Jeff.